Good morning, good afternoon everyone. My name is uh, Michael Krieg. I'll be your moderator for today's uh, webinar. Um, uh, before um, passing the word to, uh, to the presenter of today, um, just like to notice this is a live webinar. We will be hosting a, um, a Q&A at the end and uh, all participants have the possibility to send in your, your questions via the chat panel on the, uh, the right hand side of your, uh, of your screen. If you're following us via the GoToWebinar app, just click the uh, question mark icon and submit your, your question there. Um, it's not only me, we have more people on the call today to answer your uh, questions. Um, maybe Russell, quick introduction. Hey, hello, uh, I'm Russ Bloomfield. I'm an application development engineer with DSM. Thanks for joining. Okay, Peter. I'm Peter Geitsman, working at the DSM Material Science Center. And my expertise, and I'm a, I'm a principal scientist. My expertise area is polymer degradation and stability. Okay, thanks. And now I'll give the word to uh, the presenter of today. Uh, thank you, Michael. And good afternoon, good morning, or good evening for the viewers uh, of this webinar. Uh, my name is Jens Lau. I am a material scientist at DSM Material Science Center here in the Netherlands. And today I would like to uh, discuss with you a little bit more on this important topic on understanding why and how thermoplastic react to automotive fluids. So a little bit more introduction. So um, during my uh, time at DSM, I have been involved in uh, several research topics. Uh, mostly related to durability of polymers in harsh environment, uh, predominantly related to chemical resistance and heat stability, but also uh, in the topic of metal corrosion. So this is during the processing of polymers itself. Uh, also work a lot on the uh, optics and surface appearance, as well as thermodynamics and soft condensed matter. And as already uh, introduced to you uh, beforehand, there are two panelists uh, with us today, Russ Bloomfield and Peter Geisman. Uh, this presentation will be approximately 20 minutes. And my outline today, uh, I would like to start with, uh, give you a little bit, a little bit more uh, introduction on the plastic for automotive fluids. It will also be followed by some typical challenges that we have uh, encountered during the chemical resistance study. And uh, presentation will be closed by uh, some discussion regarding what better chemical resistance of plastic allow us to do. So to talk about plastic for automotive applications, uh, uh, one of the obvious question is why using plastics for automotive applications uh, in the first place, right? Uh, so usually uh, the uh, plastics has been applied as a metal replacement. So this is really linked uh, heavily towards weight reduction as well as uh, lowering down of CO2 gas emission. And uh, as you know, uh, there are a lot of different types of plastics uh, starting from standard plastic up to advanced engineering plastics. Uh, but in order to be able to choose uh, which plastic that we want to use for which uh, for a certain type of applications related to durability we really need to first address and know a little bit more on uh, what the performance criteria and how uh, certain type of plastics will be expected to perform under such environment so this is a really important topic uh, to uh, to address and to talk also a little bit more on durability of plastics in general uh, if you think about application of plastic for automotive applications uh, typically, there are three things that pop to mind. So the first one is related to the thermal oxidative stability. So how plastic perform at high temperature, high uh, relative humidity environment. So this is something that, that, that we, we do at DSM. Uh, the second one is the chemical resistance. So this is the topic of today. Uh, and, and the third one is the UV resistance. So a bit more into the coating, uh, how the uh, uh, the impact of UV exposure to plastic coating in the automotive. So this uh, three aspect is being addressed by DSM, but today we are talking about chemical resistance. So typically where we are, we are talking about chemical resistance of plastic, uh, the type of environment or factors that can play roles in degradation of plastics is uh, high temperature, high humid condition, uh, whether there is acid or alkaline uh, uh, species uh, in the aging medium or in the automotive fluids in general. 
So these are the things that we are going to address for the next few slides. So a little bit more back on uh, what type of automotive applications that we uh, we typically expect uh, for plastic to have a required chemical resistance. Here I give you uh, two, uh, let's say, uh, a family of 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 uh, of uh, application of plastics. So the first one is uh, related to the use of plastic part for ICE for internal combustion engine, and the second one is uh, plastics used in EV that really require chemical resistance. So for example, uh, I, I take an example of a uh, time chain tensioner. So this is the plastic part used for under the hood applications that really needs a certain resistance towards hot engine oil, right? And for electric vehicle, uh, for example, the uh, thermostat housing or coolant tubes, they are usually uh, type of plastics that you want to have a resistance against a certain engine coolant. So usually composed of 50-50 water glycol with uh, certain additive packages. In addition to these two criteria, uh, we usually also encounter with different type of automotive fluids. So you can imagine from different type of fuel, different type of oil, uh, different type of coolants, and uh, other chemicals such as AdBlue. For example, this is, as you know, uh, additive used for uh, diesel trucks and at blue per definition is uh, basic in general so uh, whatever plastic component needs to be used for that type of application also need to be resistance again basic alkaline solution uh, chemical resistance to talk about chemical resistance of plastic is is usually a very broad topic as you know uh, performance of material really depends on three factors. The first one is related to the material composition and dimension. Uh, second one is related to aging conditions. Uh, and the third one is, is something that is not straightforward, but uh, uh, sometimes people uh, find it challenging is uh, different testing condition. So if you are talking about material composition and dimensions, I think something that, that is so obvious, for example, uh, if we are uh, injection mold a certain plastic part that has different uh, uh, thickness so obviously uh, a plastic part that has thinner uh, dimension they will they will start to degrade much earlier than plastic part that has a thicker dimension uh, an example for variation in aging conditions you can imagine that uh, let's say uh, uh, certain aging temperature so the higher the temperature uh, used for aging means also uh, the faster the degradation of, of plastic part uh, will be. Uh, one thing that is also not dot obvious here, uh, I want to highlight is the aging setup and procedure. So time and again, uh, when we uh, do our aging uh, uh, condition test, uh, there is also one factor that play a role, uh, uh, namely polymer to medium ratio. And I will come back to this uh, particular point later uh, in, the, in the presentation. Uh, the last, uh, which is the variation in testing conditions, I think this is also uh, 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 something that we really need to keep an eye on. Uh, what type of sample pretreatment that we do after aging is becoming important. So, for example, if you are age, uh, if you do perform uh, some certain series of aging of polymer uh, in acidic solution, and uh, after aging you dry the sample and you do testing, the, the result of course will be different when the sample after aging is not dried. So you basically compare the performance of material in the wet condition versus in the dry condition. So all these parameters play a role in the eventual performance of the material itself. And, and the takeaway message here uh, is sometimes we are encounter with, let's say different chemical resistance data set coming from two different sources uh, of a single of the same material. And sometimes it's also, it is it's kind of difficult to judge or to compare this data uh, since we usually do not know exactly what type of uh, aging condition used, uh, what type of testing condition used. And, and, and as such that uh, I would like to, uh, to advise really people to take, uh, take a little bit more cautions on how do we look at the chemical resistance data set because it's usually there is, uh, unless the, the experiments is done at at the same time, at the same uh, location, at the same with the same procedure, we'll probably have a different type of uh, uh, results. 
So to highlight this, uh, this uh, nuance of, of, of different uh, factors that can play a role in the, in the eventual results, I give you two examples. So this first example is related to performance of polyamide, in this case polyamide 4.6, after aging in automatic transmission fluid, either in nitrogen environment or in air environment. So on the left-hand side figure, you see uh, the tensile strength retention measured at room temperature of polyamide 4.6 aging uh, age at uh, 150 degrees Celsius in ATF, either under nitrogen blanket or in free air. And you see uh, uh, the, 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 the black curve rep, uh, represents the uh, tensile strength retention uh, during aging in nitrogen environment, whereas uh, uh, the, the orange one is rep representing the result that we have uh, in air. So you see that actually, uh, when you do perform when you perform aging of uh, polymer in ATF under nitrogen blanket, typically there is no degradation whatsoever. Uh, whereas if you change the nitrogen blanket to air, and there is there is a huge degradation there. Uh, the same thing also uh, shown uh, in the right hand side figure. In here we are looking at instead of tensile strength retention, we are uh, looking at molecular weight retention of polyamide 4.6. Uh, H in dextron 6 ATF at 150 degrees Celsius. Here again, you see that under nitrogen environment, there is nothing happens, but as soon as you change the nitrogen uh, with air, uh, you, you see that there is a molecular weight degradation of the polymer uh, during aging. Second example, uh, it is also very important. What I want to highlight here is the effect of different polymer concentration at the starting point of the aging. So the left-hand side figure shows tensile strength retention versus aging time uh, in ATF uh, for two different scenarios. So the first scenario is when you start aging uh, of polymer, uh, you put polymer in jar and there are 28% of polymer uh, in 80% uh, of ATF uh, versus uh, the scenario on the, on the orange curve where instead of 20% polymer, you use 10%. Uh, polymer in 90% ATF. And you see here that the degradation when you start to reduce the amount of polymer that you, you put in the jar is quite starking. Uh, the degradation speed uh, for less amount of polymer is usually very uh, much more rapid than the degradation speed when you use more polymer uh, during aging in the same jar. But the same thing happens in the right hand side figure. Here uh, I plot strain at break retention, that's aging time for thermoplastic elastomer. Uh, H index from 6 ATF. The same thing when you use more polymer uh, in the in the uh, during aging, uh, usually the degradation speed will be uh, will be uh, less, let's say, uh, dramatic than the degradation speed when you use less polymer. Uh, there is one very simple way to explain this phenomena. So uh, 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 imagine that if you start to perform aging of polymer in certain aggressive medium. If you have more polymer inside the aging medium, uh, then on average, the amount of, of, uh, of, of aggressive media that can start uh, degrade the polymer will be less. So uh, again, this highlighting a little, bit, a little bit different type of nuance, a different type of level of details uh, where uh, something is not really that obvious that actually a lot of times uh, we, we implement a certain procedure that we maintain at the starting point. We always uh, advise uh, our customers, our uh, lab colleagues to use a certain uh, fixed amount of uh, polymer to, to, to medium ratio because of this particular uh, uh, reason. So the next uh, slide, I would like to talk about a bit more very uh, quickly on the degradation mechanisms of polymer uh, during chemical aging. Uh, there are three uh, main uh, mechanisms that I want to, to, to discuss with you. Uh, the first one is really related to dissolution of polymer by chemical reagents. So this is typically what happens when you put polymer in, in certain solvent that, is, uh, that can uh, dissolve the polymer itself. So just to give you a highlight, uh, an example of this, uh, uh, we are all having, for example, our uh, laundry machine or dishwasher uh, at home and we usually put this uh, plastic pot uh, that contains soap in it and this plastic pot usually made of polyphenol alcohol 
And if you put polyphenol alcohol in water, they will start to dissolve within a matter of seconds by design, right? So this is the, the, the degradation mechanism that I'm talking about. Uh, the second one is related to the absorption of chemicals into polymer. Uh, this is not per se related to degradation uh, uh, mechanisms directly. So this doesn't change the molecular structure of the polymer itself, but it's related to physical absorption. So just to give you a little bit more illustration on this, um, I used the example of a soft contact lens made of silicon hydrogel uh, that contains PMMA, for example. So if you have soft contact lens and you uh, let it dry on bench, uh, what happens is that the contact lens starts to shrink. So uh, uh, dimensional stability is, is, uh, is, is not good there, but also the material becoming more brittle. Uh, as soon as you put water, uh, on top of the uh, of the contact lens, then what happens is that uh, the uh, uh, the contact lens start to absorb water and start to uh, let's say a form of much smoother face, uh, smoother uh, form, and uh, it's getting more ductile. So this is the this is uh, just to illustrate uh, the effect of absorption of chemicals into polymer uh, uh, properties and mechanical properties in general. Uh, the third one, which is really the most famous and the most popular one, is chemical reaction. Uh, so what happens when you have polymer in direct contact with chemicals? Uh, there will be chemical reactions between the polymer and the, the, the reagents and as such that the polymers start to be degraded. Degraded here meaning really uh, lowering down of the, uh, of the molecular weight of the polymers. That will result in a lot of uh, phenomena uh, related to for example, cracking, lowering down of tensile strength, and lowering down of overall uh, mechanical performance. So uh, this is the, th the, the third point is the one that I want to highlight here today uh, uh, due to our limited, let's say, time. So I, I want to focus on number three, but if you have question on number one and number two, just feel free to, to contact me after this presentation. So uh, the, the degradation mechanisms due to chemical uh, reactions, uh, I think one of the famous one is, uh, is what happens if you put polymer in water. And we are talking now about hydrolysis reactions. So here I just used uh, two examples. Uh, the first one is uh, a reaction between polyamide with water. And the second one is reaction with polyester with water. So as, as you know, uh, if you have a, let's say, uh, polyamide uh, submersion water, what happens is that water start to uh, hydrolyze the amide bonds. Hydrolyze here means uh, chain breakage or chain scission uh, between the carbonyl and the amine part as such that you produce carboxylic acid end groups as well as amine end groups. The same thing also happens for polyester. So the ester bonds uh, is prone towards hydrolysis uh, as such that uh, you break the ester bond uh, between carbonyl and ether so you have carboxylic acid N and hydroxylic N groups. Uh, so this rate of hydrolysis, the rate of reaction in general, typically uh, higher at higher temperature following Arrhenius law. And uh, it's also high when there is a presence of acid or base. So we call this acid catalyzed hydrolysis or base catalyzed hydrolysis. Uh, so this is a very important phenomena. Uh, typically we encounter this in uh, exhaust gas recirculation type of applications where we, for example, apply a certain plastic hose, uh, a certain plastic hose uh, that is in direct contact with, uh, uh, with acid, acidic gas or acidic condensate. So this is uh, highly relevant for that type of application. Uh, here, I would also like to give you just an illustration of what is the impact of uh, hydrolysis towards uh, molecular weight of polymer as well as the tensile strength. So the left-hand side figure shows the uh, decrease of molecular weight. Uh, this is for polymer at 4.6 as a function of aging time at pH 7, pH 2, and pH 1 at 100 degrees Celsius. As you see here, that if we start from neutral pH, the degradation speed is not really that fast, but as soon as you switch uh, the pH by adding more and more acid species, for example, in, the, in this case, pH 2 or pH 1, you see that the degradation speed is much more rapid uh, due to the fact you have, instead of hydrolysis, you have acid catalyzed hydrolysis. Uh, this molecular weight decrease uh, eventually will lead to tensile strength, 
uh, reduction. Uh, and also uh, here on the right-hand side figure, you see that at for pH 7, the reduction is not really that dramatic as pH 1. So there is really a one-to-one -one correlation between uh, a drop in molecular weight with the drop in tensile strength during aging. So we cannot really separate out uh, molecular degradation and mechanical degradation because they are identical. Uh, just to give you illustrations of the uh, of the uh, of the important parameters other than the degradation rate or kinetic rate of reactions, there's also uh, 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 aspects uh, which is called diffusion of of uh, chemical reagents into polymers. So this is a cartoon that I I, I may just to highlight this uh, this phenomena. So imagine that you start you have a polymer part that you start to age right inside a, a certain uh, chemical medium what happens is that the, uh, the the chemicals start to go into the polymer so it's diffused from from outside in as represented there in the in the orange uh, band and uh, when you wait longer long enough uh, the diffusion will be further and further goes into the core of the materials but at the same time you also have massive degradation at the skin layer as such that sometimes it's manifested towards the cracking or towards the mass loss uh, due to the uh, molecular weight degradation at the skin layer. So uh, not only the rate of reaction is important in this case, but also the diffusion, the speed of ingress of these chemicals into the polymers becoming important. Uh, the second, uh, the third uh, parameter that's also important is the maximum amount of uh, active species that can be absorbed in the polymer. So there are three parameters responsible for overall degradation of three-dimensional uh, uh, part. Uh, the first, most important one is reaction rate, but also diffusion and also solubility. So these three are very important parameters and we keep on, uh, let's say, monitoring these three parameters. So just to give you a little bit of a, of a, of a, a general background, if all these three parameters are, are small or low in, in, in quantity, then for definition, you have a much more, much better chemically resistant material. And if everything is high, if your reaction is high, if the, uh, the, 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 the chemical reagents goes in very fast and the monoprasorption is also very high, then you, you, you also, uh, per definition, have a very bad uh, chemically, uh, uh, very bad uh, resistance of polymer towards this, uh, these chemicals. So uh, to highlight this particular case, uh, just to show you that um, we, we, we study this, uh, let's say, uh, uh, interactions uh, between the diffusion and the, and the, and the chemical reactions. So here, uh, it, this is the, uh, the left-hand side figure is uh, showing you the cross-sectional uh, profile of polyamide six tensile bar, it's four millimeter thick, that we compound together with bromopenol blue. So the pH, uh, of bromophenol blue uh, when, when uh, above 4.6, uh, the, the local pH, then the, the, the material will look purple, but as soon as the pH goes below three, then the material becoming yellow. So what happens here is we dip this in the pH one solutions at 100 degrees C, and then we, we take it out after a certain period of time, and we make a cross-sectional profile, and we study the development of yellow band, indicating the speed of ingress of acid from outside in. So you can make use of this information to calculate the diffusivity of your uh, of, of, of the of the active species, but uh, one thing that I want to highlight here is uh, 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 most of the time that if you look into uh, cross-sectional profile of this material, the uh, degradations or the the, the cracking uh, happens in the yellow bin area. So it's also a nice a uh, nice kind of visualization uh, way to show you the most likely area where uh, the material starts to fail. Uh, in this case, the, the, the area where it's mostly populated with acidic species. So we, we, we play around with this also for uh, research purposes, but I think it's really good to show you because this is a kind of a visual way to, to, to show there is a uh, relations between the ingress of acid as well as the, uh, the degradation locally at the skin layer. Um, so far, I've been talking about uh, pure uh, uh, base polymer without any additive, but of course, in reality, we have uh, most of the time glass fiber reinforced polymer. 
And what happens with the glass fiber reinforced polymer is usually you have three things, right? So you have matrix, you have uh, polymer, you have glass, and you have glass fiber matrix interface. And we we usually assume, and this is this is uh, mostly true, that the glass is not uh, is really inert, cannot be uh, degraded in 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 uh, in chemicals uh, reagents usually. So you're talking about uh, the material that there are only two things, two components that can be uh, degraded in chemicals. So either polymer or the interface between glass fiber and polymer. Uh, for polymer that we know chemical resistance such as PPS, usually uh, the mode, the primary mode of degradation is that this is the interface. So you see in the right hand side figure, this is a uh, glass fiber uh, reinforced PPS. And, and what you see that typically when the interface is, is, is degraded, uh, it is uh, manifested into uh, the bonding, the lamination and poor adhesion of the glass fiber interface. So you see a kind of crack form uh, at the at the skin of the of the glass fiber, as such, the tensile strength start to be degraded. Uh, we uh, 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 develop a way, uh, especially for PPS, we develop a way to optimize the strength of the interface, as such that uh, upon aging, in this case in engine coolant, 50-50 water glycol at 135 degrees Celsius, uh, after long term aging, we don't see any. Let's say degradation at the interface. Just to show you this, uh, this phenomena, the, the right hand side figure is the uh, AFM imaging of the glass fiber matrix interface. Uh, if, you, if you don't optimize the interface, what happens is after a couple of thousand hours of aging, you see cracks being formed, uh, this dark area around here. But as soon as we improve it, and after 1000 hours aging, there is no crack, and lo and behold, the tensile strength retention is much better than the material that is not optimized. Uh, this is my last slide. Uh, what better chemical resistance allow us to do? Uh, so in principle, uh, it's a lot. Uh, we can, we can uh, uh, once we know the chemical resistance of certain uh, performance polymer, we actually can use, uh, can use that information to, for example, design much thinner part because we know that we have a certain uh, 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 confidence that this part will not fail upon a lifetime. And the second part is also uh, something that, 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 that is not that obvious, but uh, if you want to increase wet line strength, for example, for grass fiber reinforced, reinforced polymer, uh, what you need to make sure of is to use matrix or you use polymer that is chemical resistance because at the wet line area, usually the glass fiber orientation uh, is not uh, optimum as such that your strength overall is depending on the strength of the, of the polymer. The last one is better performance in aggressive environmental for metal. So one of the reasons we use polymer is as a metal replacement with reductions, right? But there is also added value to that because uh, 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 typically this is what, what we see uh, usually at highly acidic environment, uh, there will be metal corrosion regardless the quality of stainless steel that you use. By replacing that metal with plastics, you actually can circumnavigate that issue with corrosion. Uh, so especially if you use uh, highly resistant uh, polymer, then that problem will not be happening anymore. So with that, I will leave it to, uh, to Michael. Uh, this is my sl last slide. And I would like to thank uh, you for your attention and for your time in viewing my presentation. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Jensen. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, uh, we uh, um, we are opening up for questions, so uh, feel free to uh, submit your questions via the uh, the GoToWebinar questions panel available on your uh, on your screen. We have three um, three material experts uh, available to to answer your questions. So. Um, first question here is, um, could you explain something about the difference between PA6 and PA66 in chemical composition? Okay, uh, the difference between polyamide 6 and polyamide 66 in terms of uh, the polarity, so if you are talking about, let's say, um, the rate of reactions and the solubility limit of a polar medium like water into those two polymer, they are usually the same, pretty identical. Uh, however, there is some differences in terms of uh, glass transition temperature. So this is very minuscule, but uh, uh, 
the third parameters, which is the diffusivity of, of medium, is governed by the TG of the material itself. So, uh, so for polyamide 6, polyamide 6, 6, just for strictly speaking chemical resistance, you, I do not see, I do not expect any difference in performance uh, in terms of uh, rate of reactions as well as solubility. But uh, TG, uh, small differences also uh, can, 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 can lead to a difference in diffusivity. Just very general. Maybe, Peter, you have uh, another comment on this? I agree completely with you. The main difference between 6 and 6.6 six is the, the melting temperature. Yeah, obviously. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, next question. Does DSM have general information on chemical compatibility of their products? Yeah, so we have a website uh, which uh, I think probably most of you know, uh, plasticfinders.com. So if you go to plasticfinders.com, you will find information on a certain particular grade. So if you if you click uh, if you put uh, the name of the grades in the in the in the website, uh, you will be presented with a lot of tabs. So if you go to chemical resistance, chemrest tab in there, you will see the list of uh, solvents that can dissolve uh, that grade. So uh, I, I encourage you to to check that. But uh, maybe one thing that that I want to highlight here. Um, that information is only valid for the first degradation mechanisms, which is related to the solution process. So it's not, it's not uh, related to uh, the chemical degradation whatsoever. So uh, when the solvent used uh, the presented in that in that in that table, uh, when you go to plasticfinder.com, uh, is is your green button, meaning that that solvent is not uh, is not able to dissolve the mat the material completely. But it, do, it doesn't mean that they cannot react uh, in the long term, uh, start to chemically degrade the sample, and as such, that you you have uh, long term uh, issues with the performance. Okay, thanks. Next question: In addition to observing change in color using the pH indicator, is there another way to measure diffusion and solubility? Yeah, thank you. Um, that is the usual way uh, we measure. The diffusion and solubility of, of, of a certain medium into the polymer is uh, via graphimetric analysis. So this is just a, a mass uptake or weight uh, <clears throat> weight uptake measurements. So you 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 dip polymer into a certain uh, liquid and then measure the the mass uh, gain as a function of time. And if you have the data set, then uh, usually can apply a certain modeling. Uh, uh, a tool uh, or modeling equations like first order Fikian, and second order Fikian equation to get the diffusivity and solubility value. Uh, there is also another way, for example, if you're interested to a certain species of, 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 um, of, um, of chemicals going into the polymer, for example, if you are uh, interested to know how much uh, certain acidic species or certain salt uh, species going into the polymer, you can also make use of other technique, uh, for example, imaging technique like X-ray fluorescence is very useful for this because if you do X-ray imaging of a certain cross-sectional profile of uh, of tensile bar as a function of aging time, you actually can calculate the amount of uh, of, of, for example, sodium or chlorine into uh, that goes into the polymer as a function of time, and also the same apply the same modeling technique uh, to get the diffusivity value and solubility value. Okay, thanks. Next question. Um, will we see different degradation speed of polymers after oil aging when oil is continuously refreshed versus never refreshed? Yeah, I have these questions a lot of times. And I think the, the general answer to this is that um, uh, usually oil will degrade upon time. So there will be, uh, let's say, a, a difference in uh, in performance of H polymer when you use uh, continuously the same oil versus you periodically refresh the oil so every 500 hours for example the the, the degradation in the continuously uh, uh, used oil will be much faster typically because the the oil quality goes down dramatically as a function of time and uh, the quality of oil what I mean is the acidity of oil 
So when you start to oxidize oil at high temperature, uh, you will create a lot of acid species and acid is very bad for, for polymer because they can, uh, they can directly attack polymer via acidolysis or acid catalyzed hydrolysis. So uh, uh, depending on the situation, which, which really mimic the reality of the applications, I would always suggest to, to, be, uh, to, 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 to be aware of this, uh, of this uh, setup and you know, of, of this, of this uh, differences between using same oil all the time versus continuously refreshing it. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's all the questions that have uh, come in for now. So uh, looking at the time, I suggest we, um, we conclude this, uh, this webinar for today. Thanks a lot for your uh, attention. You'll be receiving a follow-up email with, um, with a recording of the webinar and uh, also some additional um, registration links to uh, mini webinars we're organizing next week. So please have a look and maybe register for one of the uh, the sessions uh, next week. From my side, thanks uh, and have a good weekend.